a lot of times what's happened over the years is people have come and taken this course or other courses like it. What they've realized is they've gotten a little bit of that digging. They started digging down a little bit and they've come across a treasure and they're like, well, this is pretty cool. Oh, I wonder what else is down here. And they dig deeper and they come across more treasure. And pretty soon they're just like, man, I can't wait to get back in. I can't wait to dig through and see what else I find. It becomes this, uh, this self-fueling desire to study and to know God's word. And that's what we want to encourage because that's what it is. Unlike anything else, unlike any other piece of literature in human history, the Bible is uniquely inspired. It's, it's uniquely God-breathed. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to ask that question tonight is, in what sense, on page 8, in what sense is the Bible God's inspired word? What does that even mean? Some people say, I'll, I'll read the paragraph here at the top of page 8, uh, what's the nature of the Bible in terms of what it teaches? Is it inerrant, which means without any error whatsoever? Is it infallible, which means unable to be proven wrong in any detail? Is it authoritative, which is the ultimate authority for the believer. Well, not all Christians agree on what the exact nature of the Bible is, and many books have been written about these descriptions. Historically, evangelical Christians hold that the Bible is God's word to mankind and is therefore inerrant, infallible, and authoritative by nature. However, we have to qualify what these claims mean so that we can avoid some common misunderstandings. What does that mean? Well, well, we need to qualify that, or else we can get into defending something that the Bible itself never set itself up to be. But before that, what, what is it, when I said evangelical Christians, what does that mean? In, in political talk, evangelical means one thing. In theological talk, it means something completely different. And, and historically, the meaning is a theological meaning, not a political meaning. Only recently did evangelical come to kind of be wed with one side of the political aisle. But historically, the word evangelical, it, it comes from the, it arises from the word evangelion or euangelion. In Greek, it means good news. So evangelicals, Basically, it refers to the, the transdenominational and international movement that emphasizes need to experience personal conversion through belief in Christ and his work on the cross and a commitment to the authority of Scripture as the infallible guide for Christian faith and practice. This is from Pocket Dictionary of Theological Terms, and this is just a concise way of saying what evangelicalism is. Evangelical Christianity is that Christianity that holds to a need for a personal experience with Jesus. It's not just good enough you got baptized as a baby or even as an adult. It's not just good enough you got baptized. It's not just good enough you go to church or go to mass or go to whatever uh, your denomination celebrates as corporate worship. It's not just, it's more than that. There's a personal relationship. There's a personal relationship, a living relationship, some churches say, a living personal relationship with Jesus, and, and it's based around the fact he did die on the cross. It wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a mistake. It was the plan of God. He did die on the cross, and he did actually rise again. It wasn't just this nebulous feeling of love that flowed into the disciples' hearts on Easter Sunday, and they sensed a renewed calling to go spread the message of love and the brotherhood of mankind and the fatherhood of God. That was something that was popular you know, a generation or two ago in terms of what the gospel is about, but that is not even remotely the gospel at all. The gospel is, and 1 Corinthians 15 makes it really clear, the gospel is Jesus' body went through death and came out the other side and was resurrected. And he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come back one day to judge the living and the dead. Now, if you've ever said the Apostles' Creed, that's what you've said. That's what it means. Regardless of how people may twist or, or, or try to get around the plain meaning, that's what it means. Is, is, so evangelical Christians believe Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. And because he breathed on his disciples and said, go into the world, take this message, teach people to obey everything I'm commanding you, he gave them the authority, his authority. Remember last week we said the word of God with a capital W is Jesus. And the word became flesh. Well, then that word breathed into, inspired his followers to take his teaching 
his word and, and imparted the spirit into them so that not only were they teaching people words about Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was working through that teaching and spreading into the lives of people who believed that teaching so that they were experiencing Jesus in their midst. That's why there's so much language in the New Testament of Jesus or the Holy Spirit or people being in Christ or being in the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit or the Spirit being in you. That you is plural in the New Testament. So that's the idea and that's the basis of what uh, evangelical or some people would say orthodox, but that has in mind um, non-Protestant views as well. So orthodox and Catholic and others. Um, evangelical refers to that form of Protestantism that holds to those specifics about the Christian faith. And the main view that evangelicals hold that set them apart, evangelicals is a big tent. There's a lot of evangelicals that disagree on a whole lot of issues in scripture and in theology, but the main thing they agree on is that the Bible is God's inspired word. It's not man's words about God. That's a popular, you'll hear that in mainline circles, you know, the Bible is inspiring. Well, there's a lot of inspiring writings. There's a lot of things that inspire us. There's good literature throughout the pagan world. Paul even quotes from it sometimes. There's good pagan literature, but that's not what the Bible claims to be. That's not what the New Testament or the Old Testament claim to be. They claim to be not inspiring, but inspired, breathed into. That's literally what it means. In spirit, inspired, breathed into. So how does that work? Well, here's an a evangelical theologian. He's, he's passed away now, but um, in the 20th century named Carl Henry, he put it this way which I like this definition, he says, inspiration is that supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit, whereby the sacred writers were divinely supervised in their production of Scripture, being restrained from error and guided in the choice of words they used, consistently with their disparate personalities and stylistic peculiarities. Now, he threw in some theology tongue twisters at the end there because theologians have to write above the heads of most people just so you have something to reach for. But what he was basically saying is inspiration means God divinely inspired. He divinely supervised. He watched over. He wasn't just shouting something down and hoping that people got it right. The, the Spirit was literally indwelling the process of Scripture being written, being spoken and then being written down, and he did it in such a way that it preserved what he wanted written, what he wanted passed on, in a, in a way that was correct, and, and restrained from error in teaching something blatantly heretical. So he supervised the process, but, and this last line is key, he did it through the disparate personalities, through the very different personalities of all those 40-plus writers. So God had a person in mind, or excuse me, God had a desire for Scripture to be written. Well, that's the same God that created a universe in which a Moses would be born and would write that Scripture. Or a Paul would be educated in, under the Greeks and under the Jews of his day and then be able to write Scripture in his own style. So when you read Scripture, you read very different styles and personalities. You can hear the personalities of the authors sometimes if you have a good translation. Some translations do a better job of bringing out the personality of the authors than other translations, but the, the, the authors all wrote with their own personality, and it comes through in the text. That's, that's okay. That's what separates. That's different than what, say, if you have Muslim friends, which I hope you do. If you have Muslim friends, they believe something very, very, very different about their holy book, about the Quran. It was revealed directly to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, supposedly, word for word, exactly what God wanted said and more than written down. And they pride themselves on the fact that it has not changed even one letter over the centuries. Whether or not that's true is an issue for another class, but that is the belief that our Muslim friends have. Christianity has never held to that view of inspiration. What Christianity has held to is the idea that God inspired through the personalities of the writers, not overriding them. They weren't divine stenographers. Have you ever been to a courtroom? You know, this person that sits there and, and just taps buttons on this weird thing. You don't even know what it is. It just looks like they're just doing this. And somehow 
words come out of it. Well, that's what they are doing. A stenographer has none of their personality comes through at all. They're, they're typing ver verbatim what's being said. They are just a conduit. They're hearing and they're typing, hearing and typing. That's not what Scripture claims for itself to be. And so that's something that we always need to take in mind because according to inspiration down at the bottom of the page, what were inspired were the original authors and the original documents, the original things that they wrote from either their pen or from the pen of their scribe. So either someone would sit and write down, Paul would sit and write a letter, or sometimes he would dictate a letter. Somebody, Jeremiah, would give a prophecy, and his scribe, Baruch, would write it down. It's that thing, it's that element, that aspect of the Bible that Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, have, have always held to be inspired in some way different. See, God didn't inspire words. He inspired people. He filled the Spirit, filled people. Again, that's very different than other faiths, particularly with Islam. That's a very different view. So when you are talking with someone who comes from another religious background, you'll have to clear away some misconceptions that you may have about one another's holy books and what you think about those holy books, or at least what you're supposed to think about those holy books if you're following your belief system. Because Scripture is inspired in a very, very different way. The authors and what they wrote. So what Paul wrote to Timothy actually wrote down. That's what's inspired. Now that's different because at the top of page 9, we don't have any of those. We're going to look at this in just a minute in more detail. We don't have any of the original writings. None of them. They've all long since disappeared into the sands you know, evaporated, been burned up, been destroyed, been reused for something. I mean, the, the original writings are long gone. And our translations, even our translation of the Bible, even these translations that you hold, these aren't the originals even of that. These are translations. I don't know if you ever know this, but uh, Moses never said the word thou. Jesus never said thee or thine. Uh, they never said, thus spaketh, right? None of that was ever said. They, they spoke Paleo-Hebrew, Hebrew, Aramaic, Koine Greek. That's what they spoke, and that's what they wrote in. So that's what's inspired. The original text of Scripture are what's inspired and what Christians will, will defend as inspired by God, not translations, Translations aren't inspired. Now, I say this, this is the point, this tonight's course is the one that shakes a lot of people, and I'm all about shaking you. Remember last time we talked about, you know, the whole purpose of a dojo, a disciple dojo, a dojo is where you go and you train, and you get shaken. You get, somebody comes against you, and they're trying, to, they're really going at it. Well, this is that part of the course that for you may be like a tough sparring session, especially if you hold into uh, an extremely high view of a particular translation of the Bible. Because every translation in any language in all of human history is an interpretation. Every translation is an interpretation. And that's not just true for the Bible. That's true for any piece of literature, any work of literature in the history of mankind. It's a translation. It's going to be an interpretation. If you read... Let's say you want to read uh, uh, Don Quixote, Cervantes' novel, Don Quixote. You know, the guy that, crazy guy who goes and fights windmills because uh, he thinks they're giants. So that's a novel, very famous novel. If you want to read it, you can read it. You can pick it up at Barnes & Noble for, you know, five bucks in their paperback section, whatever. But if you want to study it and become a professor who's teaching the great classics of the world, you need to at least know that it was not written in English originally and preferably be able to read the original language in which it was written. Same thing with Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. If you don't read Russian, then you can understand the books, you can appreciate the books, you can get a lot from the books, you can enjoy them. But you will be missing whole layers of meaning and cultural understanding just by the fact that you don't speak the language. So that's something that we as Christians, we, we need to be okay with, first of all. We need to realize that. Um, there's some things... 
chapter and verse. You know, Bibles have chapter and verse. Those were never written. Uh, uh, no apostle, no prophet ever wrote a chapter or a verse number, ever. Those are added much later, much later. You know, Archbishop Stephen Langdon added chapter divisions to English Bibles in the 1200s A.D. So the church existed, the church of Jesus existed for 1200 years without a single chapter in the Bibles. And he added that. Why? So that people could understand or could quickly find where they are in the text. You know, a big book like Jeremiah or Psalms or, or even Matthew or Revelation, it's kind of hard to get your bearings. So if you want to teach about it and talk about it and, and, and read it in a lectionary or something like that, it helps to, let's break it into chapters. And then later, in the 1500s, it wasn't until the 1500s that verses were added. And that was when the Bible started, the, the whole idea of people owning their own books started coming into fashion because books no longer had to be hand copied. You know, before the printing press, everything was hand copied. So books were incredibly expensive. Well, as books became cheaper and easier and more people had access and literacy rates increased, the Renaissance, all that stuff, it became easier. Well, verse numbers became helpful. Oh, we're in chapter 10 of John. Well, what, which part, which verse? Well, the verse that starts with, no, they could say, oh, verse 8. So even the structure of how we have our Bible is, is very new, very, very new. And it's not always super helpful the way the chapters and the verses break up the passage. You know, if you get an email from somebody, let's say your mom wrote you an email about events in your family that were really important to you, and it was six pages. Let's say you, if you were to print it out, it would be six pages. You would not divide that email up into, say, five chapters and one day read one chapter. And then the next day, you'd read the next chapter. And then you'd maybe memorize a sentence from one chapter and then let that carry. No, what would you do? You'd read the email. <laughs> you'd read the letter. You'd sit down and read it. You'd read the whole thing. Because the whole thing was written at once and written to you. And it conveys something. Well, that's how Scripture was intended to be read originally, especially the New Testament, was intended as letters, and they were to be read, usually out loud. More people heard the Bible than ever read the Bible for the first probably 1,500 years of the church's existence. They were oral documents. And a lot of the times, they were written in a way that when you heard it read, it would make sense slightly differently than when you read it, because there were things like word plays, alliteration, puns, God loves what we would consider cheesy puns. They're everywhere in the Bible. Word plays are all over, Hebrew and in the New Testament. So th I say all this because it's important to realize that, not to undermine your, your faith in the fact that how can we ever understand the Bible unless we read Hebrew or Greek or whatever, but just to get us on the right, get us off, set off on the right path, on the right foot. To understand this is what, when we're going to dig it helps to know the, the, the consistency of what you're about to dig into. Because if it's bedrock, you're going to need a pickaxe or dynamite. If it's soft planter soil, you can use your hands, right? So we need to know these things so that we can be better diggers when it comes to God's Word. So the question then, why are there so many Bibles? Why are there so many different Bibles? This is page 10 in your book, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping to the second paragraph. Even before the time of Jesus, and we talked about this last week, even before the time of Jesus, the Old Testament was translated from its original Hebrew into Greek. And again, that was called the Septuagint, which means the 70. And it's abbreviated sometimes with the Roman numeral for 70, LXX. So this was the Greek Old Testament that Jews, even before the time of Jesus, were reading. They were already reading a translation and the original. Those coexisted together. Then, as the New Testament was written, it was quickly translated into various languages so that believers everywhere who didn't speak Koine Greek could read the gospel message. So over hundreds of years, the gospel's going out, people are writing it, there's, they're writing it in, you know, Syriac, they're writing it in Coptic, they're writing it in Bohiric, they're writing it in, in all these different languages that the people around the world spoke. Because the goal, again, for the gospel was not to get the exact word for word, it was to get the message. That was priority, the message, the living word. 
And so because it was a living word, the written word through which it was conveyed could alter itself to fit any of the spoken languages into which the gospel was going. But eventually a scholar named Jerome, or St. Jerome, translated the entire Bible into Latin. So the whole Bible, all of it, translated into Latin. And this was way, 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 way later, after centuries. And that became, as the church shifted and the focus of the church shifted towards Rome, away from Constantinople and more towards Rome, that became the dominant language outside of Greek Orthodoxy and Eastern Orthodoxy. That became the dominant language that people read Scripture in. And it remained that way up until the time around the time of the Reformation. And then in the Reformation around that time, people, you know, Luther and, and others started realizing we need to get this into the language that our people speak. Our people speak German. Our people speak English. Well, if they don't read Latin and they don't speak Latin, them going to church has far less impact on their life than if they can hear the gospel in their own languages, which is what God did at Pentecost when he sent the Holy Spirit to begin with. If you go back and read Acts 2, God translated through the miracle of speaking in tongues, speaking in other languages, the gospel into the languages of all the Jews throughout the empire. That's all, God's always been okay with translation. And so he did, so anyway, they, they realized, so that's when Bible started, you know, people like uh, Wycliffe and Tyndall and others started producing these translations in the languages that the people spoke, including English. And you know what? A lot of them were killed for it. A lot of them were killed by the church because they dared to translate the Holy Scriptures from the holy language of Latin into the common vulgar language of the people. Irony of ironies. The gospel that was written in common language Greek, was written in Koina street Greek, had become elevated into this expression through the Latin that couldn't be changed, couldn't be altered, and, and it, was, it was horrendous. So people literally gave their lives so that we could have Bibles in our language, in the language, the English language in particular, since that's what we all at least speak as one of our languages here.